Hello, 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 greetings, salutations, konnichiwa, and every other form of green across this vast, marvelous multiverse. I am Matsuquinox, this is Horus, and welcome, my dear scholars, to... Well, to this place. <laughs> oh, hello there. Oh, excuse me. Yulia 20, welcome. Arigato. <laughs> a little too, little too early for home. Thank yous. Uh, Private Maverick, hello. Dr. Zadium, hello. FT Waste, hello, hello, hello. Guten Abend. Ah, Guten Abend to you as well. Kanban as well. Ah, mm. So, my dear scholars, it's summertime, which of course means that it is festival time yes um, a few festivals are being celebrated over in Japan it seems um, we've al they've already had Tanabata I believe and uh, Oban as well FT wastes wait wrong language <laughs> oh dear oh you wastes oh my goodness before I continue on though how are you all doing this fine fine evening afternoon wherever you are I'm going a mile a minute. I should bear slow down. Yulian 20. Fabulous. Good to hear. FT wastes quite well. Hope you are too. Ah, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Dr. Zadium doing well. Thanks. Oh, that's wonderful to hear. Mm. Um, for myself, I'm doing all right. Um, I had a bit of a struggle getting this on. Um, I usually need some help. I mean, Horus is, of course, very helpful when it comes to putting on the, uh, the Yukata, I believe is what you call it. It's a bit difficult with the Obi. Oh my goodness. Oh. But I am doing alright. It seems a little tired, but that's to be expected, you know? And we must give a shout out to our newest scholar. Thank you for the follow, Nano Ari. Ari? Ari? Well, thank you for the follow, and welcome to our wonderful group, our newest scholar. You know, I do these streams all for you. <laughs> but, you know, I digress. As I was saying before, it is festival season. And, you know, this, uh, you call it a weekend? I suppose you would call it a weekend. Ah, this, uh, weekend, I am, uh, attending a festival myself. So I thought, well, what better time than ever to read some folk tales? And what better uh better um thing to do than read some Japanese folk tales, since that is the matter of festival we are attending. <laughs> so um I dug out quite a few actually. I've got two books prepared. I might grab a third if I need to. But I do have quite a few stories to read, and um, we'll have little discussions as well. Um, question, my dear scholars, do you mind the music playing? Or would you like me to uh, turn it off while we're reading? Oh, hello there, Firefly. Welcome. You're just in time. We haven't started yet. We're going to be reading some Japanese folk tales. Turn it down a little bit when we're reading. It's a little louder than you, okay. Is that better? Or should I uh, turn it down even more further? Ah, that's better. Good, good. Yulian 20 makes me want to dance. Oh, yes, yes. These festivals are the best time to do, uh, to do dancing. And you know, the sad thing is, I actually do know some uh, festival dances. But unfortunately, I don't have, um, I don't have any of the, uh, arm movement prepared. So I can't actually show you how to do the dance. But I have done a few dances myself. Union 20, you get to go to a festival as well? Oh, that's wonderful. They're a lot of fun. They're always a lot of fun. And I always do dress up in a yukata for it. I mean, when you're going to a festival, why not? 
Firefly would have been earlier, but I had to move rooms. I saw a bigger spider on the wall after sitting down, and like a few seconds later, it was gone, and I don't know where it went. Oh my goodness. Well, I'm, I'm sure that spider meant no harm. Probably just wanted to uh, greet you. But, in any case, that is probably the best move to do. Um, we actually do have a room here in the uh, study, which is uh, full of spider webs. Mm -hmm. I'm not joking. I haven't seen any spiders, though, although book squids do tend to mysteriously disappear in that room whenever they go in. Probably not the best sign. Anyway. Well, my dear scholars. Do you think maybe we should start with our readings for the night? Let's say you. Firefly, yeah, but it was on the wall next to the bed. I was on, like, just no. Ah, I don't blame you. I don't blame you. Julian 20, yes, please. Dr. Zadium, yep. Oh, we have eager listeners, it seems. Let me get a drink of water. FT Waste, huh? I'd have thought the Cosmic Library didn't need the internet, but it seems you're connected to the web after all. Oh my goodness. Why? Why, Wastes? I thought better of you. I thought better of you. Waste. That's my one for the night, I promise. Oh, hello there, Kintron. Welcome. And you just uh, just came in to witness Waste drop a pun, of course. FT Waste, please feel free to begin the stories. Firefly, like there's only ever just one. True, I suppose. True. All right, then. Well, my dear scholars, sit back, relax, have a hot or cold beverage. Enjoy the festivities, and tonight we'll begin our reading of some Japanese folk tales. <coughs> so our first tale is actually a fairly famous one, at least um, in some parts of Japan. Some of you might have heard of it. It's uh, entitled Shepitaro and the Phantom Cats. Now, before I read, the copy, the book I am... Oh, hello there! Welcome, Sunny Day Enjoyer! And thank you for the follow! And thank you for the resubscription, Sophia! Welcome! It's good to see you! Oh, and th thank you for the subscription! Sunny Day Enjoyer, do you have a favorite one? Oh... Oh yes, I do have a favorite story. Unfortunately, it's not in this collection. Um, it is a short story entitled Starfire. If I'm daring, I might try to tell that story from memory. Though, I don't remember all the details. But we'll see. If we have time, I will tell that story. It's my favorite Japanese folktale. It's not very long, I don't think, but I've, I've heard it quite several times, and I always love it. So as I was saying, this copy, the book I am reading uh, this folktale from, um, it is an early collection of Japanese folktales. Sunny Day Enjoyer. I'll take a look at it. Thanks for telling. Oh, good. Wonderful. And glad to have you here. For those who are just entering, I'm Matsu Quinox, Interdimensional Omniversal Librarian. I'm a reading streamer as well as a gaming streamer. And tonight we are reading Japanese folk tales. So, as I was saying, the book I'm reading from is a collection that was done by, I believe it was an English author, of um, various stories from Japan. And because it's an early collection, the author chose to anglicize certain terms. Now, I am actually going to de 
anglicize those terms because I know exactly what he was talking about. But reading it as it was written feels a little bit odd in places. <coughs> For instance, instead of samurai, he uses the term knight, which of course is the nearest equivalent he could have find. So I'm going to turn it back into samurai, since that was the original version of the story. Shepitaro and the Phantom Cats A certain samurai took shelter in a lonely and dilapidated mountain temple. Towards midnight, he was awakened by hearing a strange noise. Gazing about him, he saw a number of cats dancing and yelling and shrieking, and over and over again he heard these words. Tell it not to Shepitaro! At midnight, the cats suddenly disappeared. Stillness reigned in the ruined temple, and our warrior was able to resume his slumber. The next morning, the young samurai left the haunted building and came to one or two small dwellings near a village. As he passed one of these houses, he heard great wailing and lamentation and inquired the cause of the trouble. F.T. Waits, huh, I never considered the similarity between Samurai and Knights. Well, there is somewhat of a similarity, um, which is why the author chose to, uh, to translate it that way. Alas, said those who thronged about the knight, very well may you ask why we are so sorely troubled. This very night the mountain spirit will take away our fairest maiden in a great cage to the ruined temple where you have spent the night, and in the morning she will be devoured by the wicked spirit of the mountain. Every year we lose a girl in this way, and there is none to help us. Sunny Day Enjoyer. I believe samurais are more of a caste and knights are just a profession. They were. Samurais were a specific caste within the... Um, within Japanese society at the time. The uh, caste system was eventually abolished many years later, but at the time they were a specific caste. The samurai, greatly moved by these pitiful words and anxious to be of service, said, Who or what is Shibitaro? The evil spirits in the ruined temple used the name several times. Shepitaro, said one of the people, is a brave and very fine dog, and belongs to the headman of our pre of our prince Prince, that's an odd thing. Our village is what he means. Belongs to the headman of our village. The knight hastened off, was successful in securing Shepitaro for one night, and took the dog back with him to the house of the weeping parents. Already the cage was prepared for the damsel, and into this cage he put Shepitaro, and with several young men to assist him, they reached the haunted temple. But the young men would not remain on the mountain, for they were, f they were full of fear, and having performed their task, they took their departure, so that the knight and the dog were left alone. At midnight... The phantom cats again appeared, this time surrounding a tomcat of immense size and of great fierceness. When the monster cat saw the cage, he sprang round it with screams of delight, accompanied by his companions. The warrior, choosing a suitable opportunity, opened the cage, and Shivataru sprang out and held the great cat in his teeth. In another moment, his master drew forth his sword and slew the wicked creature. The other cats were too amazed at what they had seen to make good their escape, and the valiant Shivataru made good, soon made short work of them. 
Thus, the village was no longer troubled with ravages of the mountain spirit, and the samurai, in true noble fashion, gave all the praise to the brave Shepetara. So a few things about this story, actually. So, Shepitaro, you can visit the temple where Shepitaro apparently is um, buried. There's an actual place in Japan. Um, I'm not sure the location. Let me take a quick peek quickly because I want to make sure I get this right. So supposedly, trying to find the thing, the temple that apparently the story is based off of, at least part of, is in Iwata, um, which there is a temple, but the dog is not named Shibataro. It's name. It has a different name, um, but. There is a theory that the dog that is celebrated at that temple is the same dog as Shibitaro. Now, it's interesting also to note that this story has variations. Um, when I originally heard this story, there was a um, sunny day enjoying mercenary activity was common practice among samurai. Um, actually, it wasn't uncommon. Um, especially among samurais who were of lower level, I believe. And um, especially those who had no master. Ronin, as you might know them as. Um, samurai do figure in quite a lot of folk tales as heroic figures. Um, the version I first heard this story of did not have a samurai in it. Instead, the... Um, the hero of the story was a priest. As well, uh, there were other little differences. Um, Shevitaro was owned by a random old man who the priest meets on the road. Um, and in that version of the story, there are no phantom cats. Rather, the um, monsters are monkeys and a gigantic baboon. Well, a gigantic monkey, um, who serves as the antagonist. Otherwise, the story is actually quite the same. Um, the legend, I guess, has been done as a kabuki play, I believe? Or a variation has been done of it. But it's a fairly popular story. I have also heard the version that uses cats as the um, as the basis. Oh, hello there, cool skeleton. Welcome. You just missed our first story, I'm afraid. But you're well. But welcome to our little festival. Glad to have you here, my uh, my skeletal friend. Let us put it that way. That one I chose specifically because I had heard it before. So it's a little bit well-known. You'll notice I'll be going back and forth between some stories which are a little more well-known um, and some stories which are more obscure. Um, don't expect the likes of Momotaro or um, Kintaro or those, those figures to appear in tonight's readings. I do want us to explore a little bit of the more well well-known ones, less well-known in popular culture, let us put it that way. So our next story is actually a, a, a fairly short one. Um, this one is one that I believe I read once before. Unfortunately, it was on a stream which I did not save the original um, VOD of, so it is lost to time. But I thought I would reread this little short, little fun story. 
once again. This story is called The Old Mackerel Peddler. FT Waste Matsu Lost Lore. Love, love, love the outfit. Well done, Matsu. Hi, Horace. I love you. As always, blah, blah, Horace says he loves you as well. And thank you. Horace helped me uh, put this together. <coughs> when Todaiji had been built, and the great Buddha was ready to be consecrated, Emperor Shomu appointed the Indian monk Badaman, recently arrived in Japan, to preside over the ceremony. But who should Badaman's assistant be? The emperor could not decide, and he worried till he had a dream in which a holy being came to him and said, You must appoint as assistant the first man to pass the temple on the day of the consecration. Never mind whether he is a monk, or a layman, or a noble, or a nobody. The consecration was sent was set for the fourteenth day of the third moon of seven fifty two. The emperor made up his mind to do exactly as he had been told, and posted guards at the appropriate time to keep watch. Along came an old man, carrying a basket of mackerel over his shoulder, on a pole. The guards whisked him straight off to the emperor, who dressed him in priestly robes, and had almost appointed him when the old man finally protested, Dear me, your majesty, I'm not at all the man you're looking for. I'm just an old mackerel peddler. But the emperor ignored him. Darth Lightning flashes, chat gets horrified, then they realize it's just me using my Sith Lightning to make a grand entrance. <laughs> welcome, Darth, welcome. We're on our second story of the night. Soon it was time for the ceremony, and the old man was installed on a throne right next to Baramon, with his basket of mackerel beside him. His pole was stuck in the ground east of the entrance to the hall. When the rite was over, Baramon came down from his throne, and the old man just vanished. I thought so, said the emperor to himself. He was magic. Then he had a look at the basket. Those had definitely been mackerel in there. But now, they were the 80 scrolls of the Kigan Sutra. The emperor wept and prostrated himself in awe. His vow to build the temple had been well conceived, and a Buddha had come to help him. The macro peddler's pole is still by the entrance to the hall. It hasn't grown or burst into bloom or done anything in particular. It's just there. I always like that little bit at the ending, because often when it comes to items of, say, holy nature in these folk tales, something miraculous happens to them. They bloom, as they say, in flowers. They grow, or something wonderful happens. But in this case, it just stays a pole. And um, the story does reference some act, some real, um, some real events that did occur, maybe not the, uh, the fish peddler vanishing, who knows in that case, I will not, I will not insult anyone who, um, is of that, um, but the, there was a great, there was a Buddha built in, um, the Todai Ji Temple, uh, very large, it's still there today, um, it was consecrated by a monk from India, as was the proper proper thing to do when you were consecrating a uh, statue of the Buddha. Um, actually, in fact, I saw a folk tale on how that was made, and it's fascinating. It is fascinating how they made that Buddha. It took a long time, a lot of men, and a lot of artisans to put it together. Um, 
it's it's it is fairly interesting and this story is based around the event of its consecration which was I don't know how many years after it first began 10 15 years after it was first built Darth, yeah, I was debating on how to make my grand entrance. It was either pun or slit lightning. I chose with lightning because I felt it was funnier. Well, thank you for not doing the pun. That would have, uh... Yes, I don't need puns tonight. But yes, I always liked that story. It's short. But I do like the ending, and I always thought it was a nice little tale to begin with. Kindron. Either way, it was a shocking entrance, Darth. Kindron! Come on! Dr. Zayn, yes, thank you. It would have been punishing for he... Are you... Are you just gonna be doing this to me all evening? For shame, you three. For shame. <laughs> Oh my goodness, I swallowed run. Cool skeleton, I see we're starting this now. Apparently so. Hmm. Apparently we're starting this now. I need to get a drink of water. Give me a second. Oh my goodness. No, oh, that was rough. I'm keeping my eyes on you three. So, we're going back to a uh, little bit more popular stories now. And this one... <coughs> this one has been referenced several times in Japanese, um, Japanese media. Um, I've seen various... Uh, takes on it. One second, my dear scholars. Please. <laughs>
Okay, so I'm back. All right then. I will try and read this next story, my dear scholars. Um, this one is is another one which is a little more famous. So. So this one, yeah. The old man who made the trees to blossom. One day, while an old man and his wife were in the garden, their dog suddenly became very excited as he lowered his head and sniffed the ground in one particular place. The old people, believing that their pet had detected something good to eat, brought a spade and commenced to dig. And to their amazement, they dug up a great number of gold and silver pieces, and a variety of precious treasures as well. With this newly acquired wealth, the old couple lost no time in distributing arm, alms among the poor. When the people next door heard about their neighbor's good fortune, they borrowed the dog, and spread before them him all manners of delicacies in the hope that the animal would do them a good turn Good turn too. But the dog, who had been on previous occasions ill-treated by his hosts, refused to eat, and at length the angry couple dragged him into the garden. Immediately the dog began to sniff, and exactly where he sniffed the greedy couple began to dig. But they dug up no treasure, and all they could find was very objectable refuse. The old couple, angry and disappointed, killed the dog and buried him under a pine tree. Oh, that's awful. The good old man apparently learnt what had befallen his faithful dog, and full of sorrow, he went to the place where his pet was buried, and arranged food and flowers on the grave, weeping as he did so. That night, the spirit of the dog came to his master and said, Cut down the tree where I am buried, and from the wood fashion a mortar, and think of me whenever you use it. The old man carried out these instructions, and he found that when he ground the grains of rice in the pine mortar, every grain turned into a precious treasure. The wicked old couple, having borrowed the dog, had no compulsion in borrowing the mortar too. But with this wicked people, the rice immediately turned into filth, so that in their anger they broke and burnt the precious vessel. Once again the spirit of the dog appeared before his master and informed him what had taken place, adding, if you will sprinkle the ashes of the mortar over withered trees, they will immediately become full of blossom. And having uttered these words, the spirit departed. The kind-hearted old man secured the ashes, and placing them in a basket, journeyed from village to village, and from town to town, and over withered trees he threw the ashes, and as the dog had promised, they suddenly came into flower. A prince heard of these wonders, and commanded the old man to appear before him, requesting that he would give an exhibition of his miraculous power. The old man did so, and joyfully departed with the many royal gifts bestowed upon him. The old man's neighbors, hearing of these miracles, collected together the remaining ashes of the wonderful mortar, and the wicked fellow went about the country claiming to be able to revive withered or dead trees. Like the original worker of wonders, the greedy old man appeared in the palace and was commanded to restore a withered tree. The old man climbed up into a tree and scattered the ashes, but the tree still remained withered, and the ashes almost blinded and suffocated the prince. Upon this, the old impostor was almost beaten to death, and he went away in a very miserable state indeed. The kind old man and his wife, after rebuking their neighbors for their wickedness, allowed them to share in their wealth, and the once mean, cruel, and crafty couple led good and virtuous lives. So this story has been adapted several times. Um, almost all the versions I've seen does not end well for the wicked couple. Um, FT Waste lesson, be good to dogs. Yes, indeed, be good to dogs. It's the best lesson in 
Cool skeleton, do not kick some puppers. <laughs> but yes, um, I've seen this adapted in various forms. Um, although, other versions I've seen actually shows how they adapt adopted the dog in the first place. That was found in a river in a box as a puppy. Which adds to sort of the mysticism of it. Kintron, two good boy stories so far. Mm-hmm. So yes. So I'm going to relax my uh, my vo vocal voice acting a little bit while I read some of this. Um, so our next story will be coming from a uh, little more obscure tones again. And this one's another short tale, and it's entitled, No Dragon. Ien, a monk in Nara, had a big red nose. At first, people called him Ien, the red-nosed cleric, but shortened it later to Ien, red nose. And finally to just, the nose. Legend has it that a dragon lives in Sarusawa Pond, by Kofukuji's Great South Gate, right on the edge of Nara. In his youth, the Nose posted a notice beside the pond, announcing that on such and such a date, the dragon would rise from the pond in broad daylight. The passerby who read it was intrigued, and the word began to get around. The resulting rumor greatly tickled the nose, who after all had started himself, and he was amused at people's foolishness. Resolving to see the joke through, he went on pretending he knew nothing about the notice. Cool skeleton, if our Matsu can't go on, there's no, it's no good. Take care of yourself first. Um, I think I can go on a little bit farther with the reading. I don't want to uh, end this stream early. Just as long as I don't push the, um, the voices, I think. As the day drew near, the rumor about the dragon attracted crowds not only from nearby, but even from the neighboring provinces. The nose was impressed. What are they all here for, he wondered. How very strange. Perhaps something really will happen. But he went on looking as innocent as ever. On the day, the streets were so jammed that even the nose began to take the story seriously. Since apparently the dragon was going to rise, he wanted to go and watch. Of course, it was impossible to get anywhere near the pond. So instead, he climbed up on the foundations of the Great South Gate, which stands on a high embankment. Gazing out over the pond and the whole enormous throng, he waited eagerly for the dragon to appear. The very idea. By sunset, there was still no dragon. When night fell, the nose had to give up. He was crossing a little bridge on the way home when he nearly bumped into a blind man. Goodness, he exclaimed, you shouldn't be out in the dark like this. Why, you can't see the hand in front of your face. The nose, the blind man corrected him. You mean you can't see the nose. It had not been. The Nose's Day. He kind of deserves that, don't you agree? Kind of deserves that, don't you agree? A little bit of a... Although... That ending is a little strange. FTA Sky makes a rumor, forgets it's fake. Yes, basically. That's uh, basically what happens. Oh dear.
poor, poor nose, I suppose you could call him. Yeah. Kintron, the nose isn't a nickname to sneeze at. Oh, no. Oh, no. Please don't get me into that. Cool skeleton. If you tell the truth, you don't have to remember what you said. That is very true as well. All right. Now we're going back to uh, a little more well-known stories. This one's a little bit on the longer side, so we have a lot to read here. Kinchon, who would pick the nose as a nickname? Snot I, I say. I wish I could narrow my eyes right now. I wish you could see this, the uh, the glare I've got right now. <coughs> this story is called The Jellyfish and the Monkey. Rinjin the king of the sea, took to wife a young and beautiful dragon princess. They had not been married long when the fair queen fell ill, and all the advice and attention of the great physicians availed nothing. Oh, sobbed the queen, there is only one thing that will cure me of my illness. What is that? inquired Rinjin. If I eat the liver of a live monkey, I shall immediately recover. What? I mean... Um... What? A li- what, what? A live monkey? I mean, I can get... Uh, I can understand, you know, I have to kill it, but... The liver of a wa live monkey? Is this gonna be that kind of story? Pray get me a monkey's liver, for I know that nothing else will save my life. So Rinjin called a jellyfish to his side and said, I want you to swim to the land and return with a live monkey on your back, for I wish to use his liver that our queen may be restored to health again. You are the only creature who can perform this task, for you alone have legs and are able to walk about on shore. F2 Ace, one step up the evolutionary ladder and she'll be asking for a live human liver next. Dr. Zadium, ancient medicine wasn't just any kind of monkey business, let me tell you. Yes, I know. I know. I know. In order to induce the monkey to come, you must tell him of the wonders of the deep and of the rare beauties of my great palace with its floor of pearl and its walls of coral. The jellyfish, delighted to think that the health and happiness of his mistress depended upon the success of his enterprise, lost no time in swimming to an island. He had no sooner stepped on shore than he observed a fine-looking monkey playing about in the branches of a pine tree. Hello, said the jellyfish. F.T. wastes. Wait, what part of a jellyfish is the back, Darth? Or should she could have downgraded and asked for a mummy? Dr. Zadium, in order to induce the monkey to... Cool Skeleton, I can only take so many punches. All that wordplay is rattling my skull. Please, please stop. Hello, said the jellyfish. I don't think much of this island. What a dull and miserable life you must lead here. I come from the kingdom of the sea, where Rinjin reigns in a palace of great size and beauty. It may be that you would like to see a new country where there is plenty of fruit and where the weather is always fine. If so, get on my back and I shall have much pleasure in taking you to the kingdom of the sea. I shall be delighted to accept your invitation, 
said the monkey as he got down from the tree and comfortably seated himself on the thick shell of the jellyfish. By the way, said the jellyfish when he had, when he had accomplished about half of the return journey. Kinchon, a jellyfish out of water sounds like a tentacruel joke. Oh, that's an awful one. Darth, I would have had the perfect mummy for her also. By the way, said the jellyfish when he had accomplished about half of the return journey, I suppose you have brought your liver with you, haven't you? What a personal question, replied the monkey. Why do you ask? Our sea queen is dangerously ill, said the foolish jellyfish, and only the liver of a live monkey will save her life. When we reach the palace, a doctor will make use of your liver, and my mistress will be restored to health again. Dear me, exclaimed the monkey, I wish you had mentioned this matter to me before we left the island. If I had done so, replied the jellyfish, you would most certainly have refused my invitation. Believe me, you are quite mistaken, my dear jellyfish. F.T. Waste, oh my god, jellyfish, you don't just ask a monkey if he has his liver. <laughs> Believe me, you are quite mistaken, my dear jellyfish. I have several livers hanging up on a pine tree, and I would gladly have spared one in order to save the life of your queen. If you will bring me back to the island again, I will get it. It was most unfortunate that I should have forgotten to bring a liver with me. Kinshon, maybe the monkey has a collection. Maybe. So the credulous jellyfish turned round and swam back to the island. Directly the jellyfish reached the shore. Nah, directly the jellyfish reached the shore, the monkey sprang from his back and danced about on the branches of a tree. Liver? said the monkey, chuckling. Did you say liver? You silly old jellyfish, you'll certainly never get mine. The jellyfish at length reached the palace and told Rinjin his dismal tale. The sea king fell into a great passion. Beat him to a jelly, he cried to those about him. Beat this stupid fellow till he hasn't a bone left in his body. So the jellyfish lost his shell from that unfortunate hour, and all the jellyfishes that were born in the sea after his death were also without shells, and have remained nothing but jelly to this day. Cool skeleton. Uh, jellyfish don't have bones. They don't now. This story explains why they don't. Dr. Zadium, wow, they put him through shit. I'm not going to repeat that one, Stadium. F2 Ace, oh, it's an origin story. Cool skeleton, oh, Yulian 20, well, they don't now. There's actually a term for this kind of story. The term is often called Just So Tale Stories, named after the collection by Rudling Kipling, which has a similar sort of basis. And um, so one of the adaptations I've heard of this tale actually explains why the queen wanted the monkey's liver so badly and why she had fallen ill. And it's a very simple reason. Darth, so this jellyfish became a shell of himself after this. Oh, come on. Um, the reason for it is that uh, in the original, in the story I heard, it's because the queen was pregnant and she was having uh, cravings, which is why she demanded the monkey's liver. I mean, it's somewhat of a logical step, other than, yeah, compared to this version of the story where they give no, no reason whatsoever. In 20, I would know that feeling. Two ways. I was going to make the joke about pregnant cravings. Well, you were right. You were right. <laughs> FT waste dang it. <laughs> the story beat you to it. T waste opportunity missed.
Now we're going back to, um... Cool skeleton. The heck would you crave a monkey liver? There have been otter cravings. We're going back to this other collection of stories. Um, and once again, we have a story actually from Nara again. Which um, was in the uh, previous... Previous two stories, actually, I think were from Nara as well. Darth, on oh, my pun in my last comment was so perfectly worded, it got you good, Matsu. I fell into that one, I will admit. This story is called The Flying Storehouse. Once a monk from a remote part of Japan went to get properly ordained at Todaichi in Nara. Afterwards, he decided to stay on rather than return to his primitive hinterland and prayed to the great Buddha of Todaiji to help him choose where to live. At that moment, he noticed Mount Shirgi looming in the distance towards the southwest. He settled there, built a little chapel, and took up the ascetic life. Soon, a fine little image of Bishamon materialized for his modest altar. The monk's begging bowl would fly down every day for alms to a rich man who lived below the mountain. And every day, the rich man would fill it. Now, yes, the bowl itself is flying down. Not the monk's not coming down, the bowl itself is flying. But one day, the rich man happened to be working in his big storehouse when the begging bowl arrived. Bother that greedy bowl, he muttered, and instead of filling it, tossed it in a corner, into a corner. The bowl waited patiently, but eventually the man tidied up and left, locking the storehouse door behind him. He had forgotten all about the bowl. The storehouse began to tremble and shake, much to the household's amazement, till it shook itself loose and hovered vibrating a foot off the ground. Of course, the rich man realized, of course, it must be the bowl. I left it in there. Meanwhile, the bowl squeezed its way out, got under the storehouse, and carried it off a hundred feet up in the air. There was an uproar below. The rich man could only follow to see where his storehouse would go, and everyone else trooped in confusion after him. The storehouse flew to the top of the mountain and came down with a thud next to the monk's hut. Next to the monk's hut. Doctor Z, I am not going to repeat that. If you're all you're going to do is puns. The rich man was certainly awed, but he still felt he should say something. He reminded the monk how faithfully he normally filled the bowl and explained how today he just happened to have shut it thoughtlessly in the storehouse. He ended with a plea for the return of his property. This is very strange. The monk replied, but now the storehouse is here, I don't see how I can give it back. I have nothing like it myself, and I can certainly use it, but you're welcome to the contents. How am I going to get all that rice back down the mountain? There are a thousand sacks in there. That's easy. I'll do it for you. What a kind monk. The monk had a sack loaded onto the bowl, and then sent the bowl flying into the air. All the other sacks followed after it like a flock of geese. Wait! cried the rich man. Don't return them all. Keep a couple of hundred for yourselves. The monk refused on the grounds that he would not know what to do with so much rice. Then keep a dozen sacks anyway, the rich man pleaded. As much as you can use, they're yours. The monk said this was still far too much and refused again. Every single sack arrived in good order back at the rich man's house. 
the monk's fame spread far and wide. About that time, Emperor Daigo happened to become very ill. All sorts of prayers and rites tried on his behalf brought him no relief. Finally, an official thought of the holy man of Mount Shigi. He never comes down from his mountain at all, the official reported. He has such extraordinary powers, you see, that he can have his begging bowl fly down by itself to get him food, so he has what he needs without going anywhere. If you summon him, your majesty, I think you will find he can cure you. The emperor agreed and sent for the holy man. The messenger was awed, too, when he delivered the imperial summons. The monk just asked what his majesty wanted him for, and gave no sign of moving. The messenger explained that the emperor was ill and that his prayers were required. I don't have to go to him, the monk said. I can heal him perfectly well from here. But if you do, how will he know you're the one he has to thank? What difference does it make whether or not he knows who cured him? As long as he's cured, that's all that matters. Still, the messenger insisted, there are a lot of people praying for him, and it would be better to be clear about whose prayers worked. All right, then, the monk conceded. I'll send my spirit helper, the sword guardian. If his majesty sees the spirit in a dream or vision, he'll know that he comes from me. The sword guardian wears a cloak woven of swords. Oh my goodness, that's quite the appearance. As for me, I'm staying here. The messenger returned to the capital and reported what the holy man had said. Cool skeleton. Uh, <laughs> Kinshot sounds pretty heavy metal to me. Twenty sounds painful. F two ace. Oh no, that's too easy a setup. Cool skeleton. Huh? Sword close. Never thought of that. Well, it would be painful. The messenger returned to the capital and reported what the holy man had said. Three days later, the emperor was napping in broad daylight when he saw something glitter. He realized it must be the holy man's guardian spirit. Instantly, he felt perfectly well. The court was immensely relieved and impressed with the evidence of the monk's power. I see puns there. I'm not going to read the puns. Once again, an imperial messenger made his way to Malchigi, this time with the offer of rich rewards. Yeah, this story, you can tell that is, uh, it's been anglicized a little bit. Would you like to be a bishop or an archbishop? The emperor's message ran. Would you like an estate to provide income for your temple? But the monk said he had no use for titles and protested that an estate would be far more trouble than it was worth. I'll just stay as I am, he declared, till the messenger gave up and went away. All that was many years ago. The holy man's flying storehouse is still on the mountain, with relics of him still inside, though now it is crumbling with age. Those who are blessed to obtain the smallest fragment of its wood make it into a Buddha like the monk's own, and are sure to enjoy good fortune, peace, and ease. The monk's Bishamon, too, is still on the mountain, and countless pilgrims pay homage to it there. Excuse me, need some water. So, um, yeah, I've heard this story adapted before. Uh, the version I heard actually stops with the storehouse floating away. And in that version, the bowl goes to everyone except the rich man's house, and the rich man is the one who refuses at the very end, and it takes the entire storehouse with it rather than being a rich man who just happened to throw the um, the bowl in a corner without thinking, and thus brings about unfortune to himself purely by accident. In the version I've heard, it is much more on purpose. Hmm. 
Alright, we may end the stream a little early tonight, but I will finish up all the stories I have chosen for this evening. This next one is back to um, more well-known stories. And this one is entitled, The Tun Cut Sparrow. A cross old woman was at her washtub when her neighbor's pet sparrow ate up all the starch, mistaking it for ordinary food. The old woman was so angry at what had happened that she cut out the sparrow's ton, and the unfortunate bird flew away to a mountain. What is with these people and herding animals? It's awful, I tell you. When the old couple to whom the sparrow belonged heard what had taken place, they left their home and journeyed a long, dis a great distance until they had the good fortune to find their pet again. The sparrow was no less delighted to meet his master and mistress and begged them to enter his house. Cool skeleton, bro, how did she even catch it? That's a good question. I'm not sure. When they had done so, they were feasted with an abundance of fish and sake, were weighed upon by the sparrow's wife and children and grandchildren, and not content with these deeds of hospitality, the feathered host danced a jig called the Sparrow's Dance, which I believe actually is a real, uh, real dance. When it was time for the old couple to return, the sparrow brought forth two wicker baskets, saying, One is heavy, and the other is light. Which would you rather have? Nearly 20 hours in Swan Lake, is that close? Kinchon, well, the sparrow had eaten a lot of starch. It was probably a little stir. Mm. Oh, the light one, replied the old couple, for we are aged, and the journey is a long one. When the old people reached their home, they opened the basket, and to their delight and amazement discovered gold and silver, jewels and silk. As fast as they took the precious things out, an inexhaustible supply came to their place, so that the wonderful basket of treasure could not be emptied, and the happy old couple grew rich and prosperous. Cool skeleton, always take the light small basket. It was not long before the old woman who had cut out the sparrow's ton heard about the good fortune of her neighbors, and she hastened to inquire where this wonderful sparrow was to be seen. Having gained the information, she had no difficulty in finding the sparrow. When the bird saw her, he asked which of, two, bleh, which of two baskets she would prefer to take away with her, the heavy or the light one. The cruel and greedy old woman chose the heavy one, believing that this basket would contain more treasure than the light one. But when, after much labor, she reached home and opened it, devils sprang upon her and tore her to pieces. So, um... The version I heard does not end like that. Yulian 20, one of those stories. Yes, one of those stories. There's often folk tales around the world which uh, feature a choice between um, between two items. One bringing fortune and the other bringing misfortune in the end run. Um, you probably all are most familiar with the uh, golden axe and the regular axe. Darth, that greedy old head got what she deserved. Kinchon, why go to hell in a handbasket when you can bring hell home in a basket? That one's actually clever. I'll give you points for that one, Kintron. F2 Ace, my thoughts actually went to the tiger and the lady. Oh yes, that's a uh, that story is very famous. Darth. Clap. 
cool skeleton. I'm actually more familiar with this story than the axe story. Oh, you're familiar with this story. Um, the version I heard does not end with the old, la cruel old lady being killed. Rather, in that version, the um, old woman is still be set upon by spiders, snakes, and the like. Darth, yes, we should we should applaud Kintron. That was that was a good one. That was a good one. I will give him points for that tonight. Um. But yeah, that one I have heard variations on. And most of the versions I've heard, actually, the sparrow is not a man, but a woman. Cool skeleton. The version I heard was about the box size. Yes. Yes, there is multiple tales like that. Um, the concept being that you should always not choose greed. Any manner of... By choosing the large box, you're showing how greedy you are. But choosing a small box shows humbleness, um, which is something that often in these tales, these beans encourage. Rather, rather smart lesson, I think. So this next one actually is a famous story. Um, there are very, very, there are many variations on this tale. Um, it's actually in Kinchon. This next story is actually in one of the um, one of the colored fairy tale books by Andrew Lang. Although in that version, he quotes it as being from China. I believe, and he changes what the beans in this tale are. But it is in one of the fairy tale books. Darth, but I'm a Sith Lord. Humble isn't in my vocabulary. Well, then you're in trouble, aren't you? So this story is called Lump Off, Lump On. An old man had a big lump on the right side of his face. As big as a big tangerine. It made him so ugly that he avoided other people and instead worked alone in the mountains cutting wood. Once, once, he got caught in an awful storm and had to stay in the mountain overnight. No one else was around. He hid, wide awake, terrified in a hollow tree. Feeling as lonely as he did, he breathed a sigh of relief when he heard other people coming. Then he peeked outside. The crowd, a hundred strong, were a horrible sight. Some of some in it were red, dressed in green. Some were black with a red loincloth. Some had one eye or no mouth, and most were just indescribable. They built a fire as bright as the sun and made a circle round it, right in front of the old man's tree. He was frightened nearly out of his wits. One monster apparently the chief, sat down by the fire in the place of honor, and the rest sat in twin rows to his right and left. Next, they all began drinking and carrying on the way people do. As the wine jar went round and round, the chief got awfully drunk. When a young monster with a tray made his way slowly up to the chief, mumbling something or the other, the chief burst out laughing and waved his cup. They really were just like people. The young monster danced, and when he had finished, another began. Each one took his turn right on up to the senior monsters, and if some danced badly, others danced well. The old man could hardly believe his eyes. This is the most fun I we've ever... Ah, that's the chief. This is the most fun we've ever had, the chief declared. Now let's have something really special. Goodness knows what got into the old man then. Perhaps some god or Buddha put him up to it. But he suddenly wanted to get out there and dance. At first, he checked himself. But the monsters had a fine rhythm going. And the temptation was just too much. Out he burst from his hollow tree with his hat down over his nose and an axe dangling from his belt right below, before the chief. 
The monsters jumped up. What's this? They cried. The old man leaped high and squatted low. He twisted and wriggled all around with hoots and shouts of Ay! and Ho! till everyone burst out laughing. The monsters jumped up. Oh, I already went there. Yeah. We've been having these parties for years, chuckled the chief, but no one like you has ever joined us. Be here every time from now on. Say no more, cried the old man. I will. But it was all so sudden this time that I forgot how to end my dance right. If you liked me tonight, just wait till you see me dance properly. You are wonderful, the chief insisted. Make sure you come again. One of the chief's lieutenants was not quite convinced. The old fellow is full of promises, he objected. But I'm not so sure he will be back. We'd better keep something of his as security. Kintron Monster Dance Party sounds fun. Eh, I suppose it is. There was a that was sounded like a good idea. The chief asked what they should take. There was a buzz of voices. What about the lump on his face? The lieutenant suggested. A lump's good luck and he'll miss it. Oh, please, the old fellow begged. Take my eyes or my nose, but not my lump. I've had it for years. You're too cruel. Aha, said the lieutenant. You see, that's what we want. The monster stepped up to the old man and twisted the lump off painlessly. Be sure you're at our next party. Darth, this part sure sounds like a monster of a party. Urgh. Soon it was dawn and the birds were singing. The monsters went away. The old man felt his face and found that the lump he had had for so long was gone. He forgot all about cutting wood and hurried home to his astonished wife. Now, the old man next door had a lump on the left side of his face, and when he saw his neighbors was when he saw his neighbors was gone, he wanted to know how the old fellow had done it. What doctor did you go to? he asked. Please tell me, I can't stand by. It wasn't a doctor, it was a monster. Well, either way, I'll just do whatever you did. So what did you do? The first old man told his story, and the second listened carefully. He went to hide in the hollow tree, and sure enough, the monsters came. They sat in a ring, drank and carried on, and roared. Where's that old man? Cool skeleton, oh, is he gonna, oh, I'm not gonna spoil it. Kintron, he did the mash. He did the monster mash. I had to do that voice. Where's that old man? The second old man was terribly afraid, but he staggered out anyway. Hurry! The monster shouted, Here he is! All right, said the chief. Now dance. He danced. But his faltering steps had nothing in common with his neighbor's gleeful zest. That was terrible, the chief grumbled. Give him back his lump. Up stepped a junior monster. Here's your lump back, he said, and stuck it on the other side. The old man had gotten himself two lumps instead of one. Well, kind of serves him right, although, excuse me, in, um, I've heard this story multiple times, like I said, Julian 20, I've seen this story, oh, really, interesting, um, the story's pretty much the same, uh, the, I have seen an adaptation of this tale, oddly enough, from France, which changes it from, um, a man, men with lumps on their faces, and a pair of hunchbacks. I have also seen. I've also read in the um, one of the fairy books 
where they change it to, rather than monsters, to a group of tiny men. And again, they do it, um... Kinshon, I had a hunch. I walked into that one. Cool skill, and I believe I've also heard the hunchback one. I th Maybe I've read that one before. I don't know. Um, but I have heard the, the fairy tale one that Andrew Lane collects. In that one, it is... <laughs> In that one, it's um, Tiny Men. And it more or less keeps to the original story as well. With the lump on the face and the two old men. Darth, wait, the French one has Quasimodo's cousin in it? Um, not quite. Cool skeleton. Alright, one more pun and I will rattle some bones. You do that, cool skeleton. You do that. Hmm. Let me check something before I do the next story. You know, I was going to read one other story, but I think I'm going to change the choice for this story, because the last story I was going to read is a very sad one, and I think we shouldn't end on a sad note. So this one is a very famous story from Japan. Um, there are some differences from this telling and some later and the original story, which I will tell in the end. But I think it's a good story to end this evening on. And this one is called The White Hair of Inaba. In ancient days, there were 81 brothers who were princes in Japan. With the exception of one brother, they were quarrelsome fellows and spent their time in showing all manner of petty jealousy one toward the other. Each wanted to reign over the whole kingdom, and in addition, each had the misfortune to wish to marry the princess of Yakim Yakami in Inabi, in Inaba. Mm. Although these eighty princes were at variance in most things, they were at one in persistently hating the brother, who was gentle and peaceful in all his ways. At length, after many angry words, the 80 brothers decided to go to Inaba in order to visit the princess of Yakami. Each brother fully resolved that he and he alone should be the successful suitor. Darth, wait, 81 brothers? Holy blank. That's a lot of happy nights. Yes, that is. But I'll get to that in the after this story. Each brother fully resolved that he and he alone should be the successful suitor. The kind and gentle brother accompanied them, not indeed as a wooer of the fair princess, but as a servant who carried a large and heavy bag upon his back. At last, the eighty princes who had left their much run brother far behind arrived at Cape Kedah. They were about to continue their journey when they saw a white hare laying on the ground, looking very miserable and entirely divested of fur. The eighty princes, who were much amused by the sorry plight of the hare, said, If you want your fur to grow again, bathe in the sea, and when you have done so, run to the summit of a high mountain and allow the wind to blow upon you. With these words, the eighty heartless princes proceeded on their way. The hare at once went down to the sea, delighted at the prospect of regaining his handsome white fur. Having bathed, he ran up to the top of the mountain and lay down upon it. But he quickly perceived that the cold wind blowing on his skin recently immersed in salt water was beginning to crack and split. Ow, that would be very painful. In addition to the humiliation of having no fur, he now suffered considerable physical pain 
and he realized that the 80 princes had shamefully deceived him. Darth, are, uh, are, yeah. are that poor hair, he's probably been many hairy situation. Hmm. That one kind of works. Kind of. Million twenty nasty. Yes, very nasty. While the hair was laying in pain upon the mountain, lying in pain upon the mountain, the kind and gentle brother approached slowly and laboriously, owing to the heavy bag he carried. Cool skeleton. The bones are rattling rigorously. Oh no! Is there anything we can do to stop them? Are you gonna be okay, cool skeleton? I hope you'll be all right. When he saw the weeping hare, he inquired how it was that the poor animal had met with such a misfortune. Darth, so is my bed from all the laughing I'm doing. Well, I hope you're enjoying yourself then. Please, please stop a moment, said the hare, and I will tell you how it all happened. I wanted to cross the island of Oki to Cape Kedah, so I said to the crocodiles, I should very much like to know how many crocodiles there are in the sea, and how many hares on the land. Allow me first to all, of all to count you. And having said these words, the crocodiles formed themselves into a long line stretching from the island of Oki to Cape Kedda. I ran across their horny bodies, counting each as I passed. When I reached the last crocodile, I said, Oh, foolish crocodiles, it doesn't matter to me how many there are of you in the sea, or how many hares on land. I only wanted you for a bridge in order that I may reach my destination. Alas, my miscalc... My... Yeah, how do you say this word? Alas, my miscreable boast cost me dear, for the last crocodile raised his head and snapped off all my fur. Cool skeleton, that should they should settle down in a little while. Darth horny bodies, bodies, ha 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 ha, ha. Well, hmm. No, nah. Well, said the gentle brother, I must say you were in the wrong and deserve to suffer for your folly. Is that the end of your story? No continued the hare. I had no sooner suffered this indignity than the eighty princes came by and lyingly told me that I might be cured by salt water and wind. Alas, not knowing that they deceived me, I carried out their instructions with the result that my body is cracked and extremely sore. Bathe in fresh water, my poor friend, said the good brother. And when you have done so, scatter the pollen of sedges upon the ground and roll yourself in it. This will indeed heal your sores and cause your fur to grow again. The hare walked slowly to the river, bathed himself, and then rolled about in sedge pollen. He had no sooner done so than his skin healed, and he was covered once more with a thick coat of fur. The grateful hare ran back to his benefactor. Those eighty and wicked and cruel brothers of your yours, said he, shall never win the princess Fenama. Inaba, it is you who shall marry her and reign over the country. Darth, Matsu, this is something I like about you as a streamer. You put up with all my unfiltered comments. Well, I f nothing you say is too out of line, so I'm willing to do it. You're quite humorous, and I'm happy to have you here. The grateful ha oh, the hare's prophecy came true, for the eighty princes failed in their mission, while the brother, who was good and kind to the white hare, married the fair princess and became king of the country. Million twenty. That is because we love you, Darth. Yes, indeed. So this story, as I mentioned, is a very, very famous one. And sometimes it's paired with another story, which goes out and explains exactly how the how he the younger youngest brother won over the princess. And sometimes the story of the uh, 
rabbit. Um, jumping over the lines of the animals is considered a separate story from this one. FT Waste, honestly, I got some flashes of Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. I suppose so. I suppose so. Um, here's some interesting facts about this story. In the original story, the brothers aren't simply princesses. Princes. They're gods. They are 80 god, 81 gods, siblings, and they did come down from the heavens to marry this princess. The brother is carrying in the sack heavenly treasures. Which, um, all belong to the brothers and are gifts to the princess. So this version of the story somewhat downgrades the characters. Also in the original tale, it isn't crocodiles who, um, are the ones who the rabbit crosses, which I don't think are in Japan. I want to check on that. But rather they are sharks who the rabbit tricks and crosses. But I think that's a good story to end this fine stream on. I hope you've been enjoying this festive time. Um, so, about next week, before we close out, I'll mention next week. Uh, next week, we will be doing, hopefully, depending on things, we'll be doing more Space Quest. I think we are pretty much at the end of the game. And if everything goes according to plan, we will be doing um, more Scarecrow of Oz with uh, Sophia, which I'm looking forward to. Kinchon Crocs always have snappy comebacks, but turtles tend to be a little slow. <sighs> anyway, um, before we go, let's see if there is anyone who we can raid. Goodness. Well, let's see. Um, give me one second. I'm just checking this one. And unfortunately, it has me in an ad, so I can't check. So, here's one. Um, I have, here is a VTuber, uh, Drezaw the Wicked, who is actually reading a story by Michael Moorcock. Um, if you've never heard of him, he is a uh, Michael Moorcock, very famous fantasy writer and science fiction writer. And you know, I think we should give him a visit. We should give Dre, um, Drezov a visit. So, my dear scholars, I say unto you, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, till we meet each other again in the study. Take care, and I shall see you next time. Till then, farewell, and bye-bye.